Hello, and welcome to No Format. I'm your host, Aaron, and today I'll be talking with Freddie Vinehill Cliff of Leeds Beige Palace and Thank about their latest album, Thankology. I'd like to thank you all for joining me. Please, enjoy. And we are live. All right, folks, today we are live on no format with please state your name and uh, rank and serial number for the record. Um, my name's Freddie, uh, Freddie Vinehill Cliff, and uh, my rank is Geyser. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm I'm from the bands, some of the bands. I'm from I, I'm in, I'm in Thank, and I'm in Beige Palace, uh, and I used to help run Chunk, which was a a, a a music venue in Leeds. It's not there anymore, but hopefully it might be back at some point. But right now, it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, those those are all the things that I do. 
Uh, speaking of chunk, are you guys going to be doing a fundraiser to bring that back? Uh, almost certainly yes. Um, I don't know when. As it so basically, uh, we had to move out of there like back in November because our our lease was like due to run out, and I think we had we had enough money to like keep paying the rent until like January. But then beyond that, we had nothing. Uh, and we were like, realistically, we aren't going to be able to start booking shows again by January. So we just <laughs> had to kind of accept that yeah. we... we. So yeah, we, so, so when the lease ran out in November, we were just like, that's it. But it was kind of a blessing in disguise because it was like a stinky old building that was like falling apart. So it's kind of given us a good excuse to find like a new premises for the building. But... Uh, we haven't found it yet, so what? Watch this space. Yeah, I guess once we actually start seriously looking for a new place, then we probably will do like a fundraiser through the uh, the chunk band camp. I, I, I imagine that's good because um, I know the uh, the COVID restrictions over where you are are. Uh, I, I think they're a little bit more. Um, I don't. I don't want to say extreme. There's there's still a little bit more uh, heavy-handed at the moment? Not right now, to be honest. Like, right now, if, any, if, if anything, they're being, like, disconcertingly relaxed and it's making me nervous because <laughs> we're, not, we're not out of the woods yet. It's kind of over the past, like, month and a half, it's gotten pretty relaxed. Um, so, like, like, you can now book shows in the UK. Like, mm-hmm. people are playing gigs as of, like, maybe, like, a week or two ago. Like, you can legally play a gig. Um, are there capacity really guidelines? Wanna... <laughs> you what? Sorry. Oh, I was just saying, are there capacity guidelines with regards to those? Yeah, it's like, it's, like, reduced capacity, but it's still kind of scary, <laughs> I think. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think maybe I'm being, like, overly cautious, to be fair. Um, so, actually, yeah, so there was... I, I, I wasn't involved in this, but we did do a chunk fundraiser gig, like, a week ago mm-hmm. at another venue in Leeds called Wharf Chambers. Um, and they're the people who run Wharf Chambers, very good people. And, yeah, they, they let us have a chunk fundraiser gig there. Um, and I, apparently it went well. I wasn't there. I was away camping, but uh, apparently it was good. That is good. So that's the that's the official line from me. Is <laughs> apparently it was good. <laughs> that's you can quote me on that. Put that on the uh, uh, next poster. That's it. Alle- allegedly good. <laughs> <laughs> I heard some bands are playing. Allegedly, they'll be good. Who who can say? Who can say? By the way, I'm like I'm I, I'm very thirsty, so I keep swigging from a glass of water. But I'm always really self conscious about like the sound of like water, like being swilled about on on a microphone. <laughs> is it is it gross or, or can you not hear it? Like oh, so, so the reason the reason I'm so self conscious about this now is. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this, but I'm gonna. My ho- my housemate like does like online D and D, like Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. And a while ago, he was playing a D and D campaign, and the dungeon master was apparently like eating a kebab <laughs> like, <laughs> while while doing it, and and like was wearing a headset as well. So he's like had obviously had his headset mic like right up against his mouth. <laughs> And wasn't muting it, so my my housemate was trying to play D and D, but just had in his headphones really loudly the sound of someone <laughs> chewing a kebab. And since then, I like whenever I eat or drink anything on any kind of like video call or or like or an audio call like this, I'm just like, oh my god, am I am I that guy? Am I the dungeon master? No, you're you're coming through okay. I can't hear anything. Uh, personally, I, ha- I have my mic on a stand so I can just move it away from my mouth. You know, I could just, I could just turn it, pivot it away, just pivot it away. Or I've got, the, I've got nice. the volume knob right here. Just turn it down. I mean, I have both of those options and yet 
I'm not using either of them. I'm just just lean my, back. My coping my coping mechanism is just to say it. It's like <laughs> if I acknowledge that there are drinking noises happening, and I acknowledge that it's it might be weird, then no one can no one can criticize me for it. If I'm just like yeah, I'm just gargling and swilling all my all my drink. Um, yeah, that for some reason for me that is easier than just moving the mic away or like muting it for a second. I'd rather just acknowledge it. Just lean into the bit. Um, that's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. Because um, what was I going to say? I I did have that issue on the first episode that I was doing. I what, some guy was just eating a kebab. No, it, it was actually <laughs> me. I was interviewing uh, Scott from Ken Mode. Right. And, uh, since then, I've actually gotten a new microphone that I've taken from my ex. But you can hear all of the noise on my end. And I'm like, I'm just very embarrassed because you can hear me like making drinking noises and scratching myself. It's it's terrible. So <laughs> it's I mean, noise rock guys love that. They love that shit. <laughs> um so yeah. don't worry about it. Who cares? They love that. All the nerds. Yeah, we're all disgusting, aren't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I I decided to have you on recently because uh, I've, I, I've well, I, I just thought it would be a good lark. And because you have some... I hope so. Yeah, because you have some stuff coming up as well that I was hoping to talk about. Um, yeah. Specifically with regards to thank, which uh, I, I also have something that I want to tell you about. Um, last, go on, you you go first. Tell yeah. me about tell me about thank. <laughs> tell me about my band. Uh, I I interviewed this other band pretty recently. Uh, I think it was like last week or whatever. Uh, called Headcore, and they were like, "Oh, we we love thank." We did we did a cover of No Respect for the Arts, and I was like, "Oh, I got I got to tell, got to tell Freddie really? about that." Yeah, and so that's the second time I've heard of someone covering that song. But, I wonder if it's the same band. I don't know. I don't know the name of the band who covered it previously. So it could just be the same band that I've I've now heard about it from two different sources, <laughs> or it could be two different bands covering us, which seems obscene frankly <laughs> shouldn't shouldn't be allowed should be illegal what what did you say that band was called their ba- their name's called head gore and head gore, uh, head gore. Okay. so they're a bit like uh noisier but i was talking to them i was like okay i'll be sure to let freddie know you guys covered no respect for the arts i'm very flattered um i'd like to hear the cover yeah i'll see if i can I'll I'll see if I can uh, track it down because I'm I'm sure it's on one of their releases. They have like thousand songs. Damn, they're showing us all up. <laughs> well, they, they are coming That's from too many songs. I know, they're they're coming from like a, a like a just straight up noise background. So, you know, right. they, they you know they they're dropping releases every two weeks. So. That's like um, Theo, who is the noise guy in Thank, I guess is how you would put it. He's like the equivalent of the clown from Slipknot or or DJ Lethal from Limp Bizkit. He's, <laughs> except instead of like a turntable, he has like a, um, a literal table just covered in like springs and marbles and bits of rocks and and loads of contact mics that's that's his turntable and um, but yeah uh, no, theo has a solo project called territorial gobbing and he yeah releases like an ep or an album probably on average like once every three weeks i would say um it's good it's like uh it's pretty varied as well it's like some of it is kind of more like music concrete sort of stuff some of it is more kind of harsh noise stuff mm-hmm. a lot of it's very it's, it's got a very like comedic energy to it which i like i can't really I, well sometimes it's good but I, a lot of the time i can't get to grips with like harsh noise music where it takes itself wholly seriously because it's like inherently ridiculous music so if you're like making that 
Like, but I've been to gigs before where you see it'll be like a kind of like some old guy dressed like a German techno DJ, just like making <laughs> fart sounds with his computer and just like frowning and nodding. And you and you're just you're just expected to watch that for forty minutes and not laugh. And it's like, like I hate that. Whereas like yeah, Theo with territorial gobbing, it has like a sense of fun and uh, it. Yeah, it's got a sense of ridiculousness and I guess like a some elements of, of slapstick, I guess, mm-hmm. as well. He did an album recently, well, I say recently. If you go on his band camp, it's probably like 20 albums down. But he did one that was called, I think it was called uh, Harsh Shit Extreme Volume Music. Um, that was like the the quietest release he's ever done. And it's the sort of thing where it's like, you you have to like have your speakers on full blast to even hear it. Um, that that was really fun. I like, uh, yeah. Good I'm, times. I'm actually looking at his Bandcamp page right now, and his profile, like his his band photo, is actually pretty funny. He's just sitting down at like this table, holding like a cup of coffee with like a contact microphone in his mouth, and he's looking down at a knob and just turning it. Perfect. Classic Theo. <laughs> <clears throat> um, he um he came on tour with my other band, uh, Beige Palace. And for anyone who doesn't know, Beige Palace is, I mean, I think it's still like noise rock, but it's like noise rock, kind of calmed down a little bit. So it mm-hmm. has elements of like weird folk and like drone music and stuff. So it's it's weird because, like, it is a noise rock band, but I guess we can we sometimes get on shows where people are expecting something quite nice and in some ways it is nice Mm -hmm. but like Theo came on tour with Beige Palace as like our opening act and there were some shows we played where people were were very upset about what (laughs) Theo was doing it's like on that on that tour as well I think pretty much every show so he had this like giant headpiece that he built it was like a it was made of like chicken wire and pink felt And and it was like so he wore that on his head like this giant headpiece and then do you know do you know the the SNL skit David Pumpkins no no so it's not like it, basically there's there's this SNL skit where Tom Hanks plays a character called David Pumpkins and his entire thing is that he's he's like the Halloween equivalent of Santa Claus basically um <laughs> And one year for Halloween, I dressed up as David Pumpkins. So I had like a, it's, he's got like a pumpkin suit, like as in like a, like a business suit that has pumpkins all over it. And I had that, but for me, I don't think I can get away with wearing that in my day to day life. So I, I gave it to Theo and that's now just part of his just regular, regular wardrobe <laughs> rotation. And, but we, for the, for that whole tour of like Beige Palace and Territorial Gobbing, he was pretty much every show. I think he was wearing this like giant pink headpiece, and then the David Pumpkins suit, and it was just like, it was just like, who's this man? Like, ba- like at this point, I think it's changed a bit now. But at this point, his live sets were basically just him like rummaging on a table. He would just have like a few contact mics and a pile of things, and he would just be like rummaging through them. But it would be amplified. And yeah, people were very upset by the spectacle of this this man. <laughs> like, who's this? Um, but I digress. I feel like I've just I've railroaded this whole conversation so far. Oh, I don't mind it. That's 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 where we go on this show. We just I guess bullshit about whatever we want and just kind of let it flow from there. Um, but yeah, I, I did want to talk about you know thank and beige palace and. And what you have coming up and all that sort of stuff, which uh, uh, I've heard some of the music. You've sent me some of the songs and they're really interesting sounding. Wish I had a good way to describe them without being music journalisty. Just like referencing a band and, you know, saying sledgehammer. Um, <laughs> but it's... I mean, that's you can be music journalisty if you want. I guess... Um... Yeah, what did I send you? I think did I send you like, like a demo, of, Paris Syndrome? I think. I think I, I so. think I sent you like a demo of that that was recorded on my phone, 
So that was like pretty old. That was like maybe six months ago. And then more recently, did I send you like one track off the album, but it hadn't been mixed yet? Yeah. Yeah. So now, so so yesterday we actually finished recording. Yesterday was the last day of recording the record. Um, so we had like a week, a full week in March, but we did like most of it. So I think what I sent, one of the songs I sent you was like from that week. And then we spent three days this week, like, uh, finishing it off. So it was, it was like mostly done, but then this week we spent three days, like redoing some of the vocals. Cause my, my voice wasn't in very good shape back in March when we were doing it. So redoing like most of the vocals, uh, and just like recording extra stuff. So like Theo came in and was like, um, there's like a track of him pouring a box full of marbles onto the floor, um, and some stuff <laughs> like that. And like, uh, what else? Uh, oh, our friend Robin came in and, and played some saxophone on two of the songs. So we're really excited about that because when we started, thank, I really wanted to have a sax player like that was one of the initially that was like for me like a deal breaker. I was like, we must, we must have sax. And then at the time, I think I just didn't know anyone who played sax. <laughs> and now the band's sort of like, you know, we've been going a while and whatever. So I, I, I think the the sound that we have is maybe too established at this point for us to like incorporate sax full time. But having it on like two songs on the album is something that we're quite excited about. Um, so we did that and like... Uh, I don't even know. It's sort of like I've been in the studio for three days, and I'm like, "What have I, what have I achieved in this time?" Um, oh, there's like the they at the studio where we recorded it. They have it's not like the actual one, but it's the same one mm-hmm. um, of the the synth that's on Joy Division. I don't even like Joy Division, so I don't know why I was excited about this. But they've got like the same synth as what was used on. Love will tear us apart. They're like do, 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 do. that, you know, the, mm-hmm. the thing. Oh yeah. And uh, we put that on a song. <laughs> we did that was. I think we did that yesterday. Um, I, I think know, that's still under copyright, of, by the way. Just what? Just <laughs> just <laughs> anyone using that synth on yeah. any song? Yeah. I don't. I don't know if that's how it works. Um, well, I guess we'll find out when the ghost of Ian Curtis approaches us with a with a cease and desist um just, and not not a cease and desist is just be like guys i'm just so disappointed just so disappointed ian curtis was a tory anyway so who cares <laughs> um yeah. Oh, yeah. The other, the other ridiculous thing. I'm excited for people to hear this. Is there's a, there's a song on the album, where, I'm doing the backing vocals as well as the lead vocals. But there's like, there's like an effect, on the backing vocals, which makes me sound like, like Christopher Lee, like, like Christopher <laughs> Lee playing Saruman. It's <laughs> so, like my voice, and then it's. Yeah, the ghost of Christopher Lee on backing vocals. So it's just, yeah, basically it's it's like a very stupid album. Um, I'm really excited for people to hear it, but also I'm quite scared for people to hear it because it is incredibly stupid. Do, uh, I don't, I don't know. I I don't think you're able to necessarily look at it objectively right now because you're still so deep in it. But uh, yeah. From what I've heard, I, I think I think um, a lot of your fans are going to be. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to speak for everybody, but, but I'm going to speak for everybody. I I think they're going to love it, or they're going to hate it. That's my prediction. It's going to be. I'm cool with either way. I think so. So we've already, <laughs> as of like, like a week ago or maybe two weeks ago. Yeah. I started writing. The next record, which I thought was very stupid, but because we've not even finished the first one yet. But Rob, who's our new drummer, mm-hmm. so he, this is the first release that he's played on. But he he produced 
both of our EPs, so Sex Ghost Hellscape and mm-hmm. Please. He he produced both of those. He didn't do the the like split that we did with Blom, but the other two things he did. And he's more recently joined the band, and uh, he was like encouraging me. He was like, "Nah, like if you've already started writing album two, that's good because it means probably as soon as album one actually comes out, which is going to be maybe like at least six months from now." By the time we've got the vinyl done mm-hmm. and all that, we might we might already be like tracking album two. But I've, I've started writing it, and so so far, it like it sounds like tears for fears. That's <laughs> why, um, which I'm sort of like, I don't know. I mean, I love that, but I'm very wary of like the fact that so. I mean, I, I think that what we do anyway already has elements of like kind of eighties like synth pop. Mm-hmm. stuff but like um clearly the the large majority of our fan base is like noise rock guys which is cool like i i love noise rock um but, but yeah i'm i'm really kind of excited about the idea of like coming back with album two and it's like yeah we've just it's just power ballads <laughs> and like how how people will respond to that but the album one, the one we the one we just recorded mm-hmm. is, I think people will like it. Like it's, um, it's different to the the two EPs, but it's still like, in keeping with that. Like it makes sense, and it is, um, it's it's like it is a noise rock album. Yeah, but it's just, yeah, we've like we we've spent more time on it, and as well, it's like throughout the entire recording there hasn't been a point where all five of us have been in the same room at, like at any point partly because of covid and partly just because of the way we've been working um whereas like both of the eps especially sex ghost hellscape sex ghost hellscape is 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 literally just a live recording it's just like a very like it's not from a gig but as in it is a live performance of us in a room together in a studio yeah um and then please kind of is to a lesser extent like that was a little bit more produced but not really whereas this is like fully like a studio construction um which is fun like i've always been interested in working that way but whenever i tried that in the past with like previous bands but i've been in when i was younger it always sounded like shit so i kind of convinced myself that like no, I can only I can only record bands live. All the bands I'm in have to do everything live, <laughs> and it's been it's been nice working with Rob. Like I say, the uh, uh, the guy who now drums for us, um, he's been very encouraging, and uh, it's cool. Like yeah, it's not like a it's not going to be polished. It's still going to sound like Thank, but it's been fun to have like a different approach and like not not to stress about like okay, how are we going to play this live? It's just like, we'll make the album and then we'll figure that out later. Mm-hmm. Um, like, how how how, we, how we're actually going to do it. I think in some cases the answer is we cannot do it. Um, but that's, yeah, it's fine. Well, I, I think it's, it's important to kind of, you know, push yourself to do things that, uh, you know, you feel really uncomfortable doing with regards to, not just writing, but also performing. So I think it's it's kind of it sounds pretty exciting that you guys are heading into a not really a new direction, but maybe new. I don't know something new for you guys. Yeah, I think so. And like, um, yeah, I mean, just that the 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 whole thing of of pushing yourself and and do, doing things that you aren't comfortable with is is such a great thing. And something that has, I guess, has been a, always been a part of this band as well, because um, like we'd done stuff together before um, that was much less like brave, I would say. Like before, thank like me and some of the guys that are in this band had done other projects together before. Um, so this is like, yeah, a whole a big part of thank was like doing stuff that we weren't comfortable with. So like, for example. The lyrics, particularly on the first EP, this mm-hmm. has maybe varied a bit since then. But particularly on the first EP, the lyrics are like really uh, p- 
personal and really like fraught and really like to the point where when we put that out, I was like, oh God, everyone's going to know my deepest, darkest secret. <laughs> and then I've like said this to the other guys and they were like, what do you mean? Like we listened when we were tracking it, like they were like, what? Like, we don't know what this is about. How could we possibly understand what? <laughs> and for, for me, it was like, when we did it, I was like, man, these are, I've never written such direct lyrics. It's like that. But even just to the point of like, for that first EP, like Rob had to really persuade me to let him turn the vocals up because I'm really into like quiet vocals. But he was like, the vocals are, are such a big part of this band. Please let me turn them up. And I, uh, I was like, uh, go on then if you, if you insist sort of thing. And it's, you know, it's good. But he, And that sounds like such a minor thing, but it was, you know, it's, it's putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations and like allowing those lyrics to be exposed and and whatever else yeah um because i think putting the lyrics in the forefront the the way you, that you did uh can feel very awkward because it's not like playing a guitar riff you know a guitar can sound certain ways but it can't say you know it, it can't really describe the minutia of how terrible you're feeling why you're feeling that way or you know that you're upset because the price of cheese has gone up at the store and you feel very stupid about it so <laughs> it's like i i really do get it um because uh you know i mean it, you don't want to put yourself out there say something that is your heart on a sleeve and have people come back and say that was stupid yeah and i mean i already i already say that to myself like <laughs> six you know six months after we've recorded something i'll listen back to it and be like what's that what are you what are you saying you, you fool <laughs> um but it's cool you know people i think in general have really responded to the lyrics in thank being a lot more to the forefront than like other noise rock bands. Yeah. Um, there's a guy, a rapper, who used to be part of Chunk, like in the very early days of Chunk, talking like six years ago. A guy called Marcus, who raps under the name Algernon Cornelius. And he's a lovely man. He's he's based in Manchester now, and he he like made a a big thing of that. Like when Thank first started doing stuff, he was like really into how like forefronted the vocals were and he like made a big point of kind of telling me that and that meant you know that was really nice it meant a lot and like he's i mean i know that maybe sounds weird because it's like well what what does he know if he's like from this totally different kind of style of music but he like prior to doing algon on cornelius he was like a noise rock guy so he uh he used to play bass in a band called two trick horse who were like I don't know. They were a noise rock band. It's a, like it's a, I, I, I don't know how to describe it beyond that. Like they sounded like noise rock. It was like, have you heard of the Jesus Lizard? Like it was. Excuse me. Have you heard the music of the Jesus Lizard? Like they're really good, but it's yeah. Um, it's cool that he's doing something that's so much more like out there now. Cause yeah. It's like it is like hip hop, but it's like very weird hip hop. Um, not that there's anything wrong with like hip hop that isn't weird, but what I mean is, you know, he's doing uh, some really progressive stuff, I guess. Yeah.
I think. Like, oh God, sorry. <laughs> I just dropped a coaster. Um, I, if, what I was going to say is let the record show that I am in favour of normal hip hop. <laughs> let, the, let the record show. Um, I, I, well, I was actually going to say that it's, it's. Uh, I, I think since Death Grips dropped the money store, or is it mm-hmm. ex-military, hip hop's been getting a little weirder. You know, I think. I think before that, to be honest, but uh, yeah, I mean that was certainly like a flashpoint. Yeah, um, I, I think I think lawsuits also kind of changed that as well. Where you know all these rappers they stopped sampling stuff so much and they just started like writing music. Not mm-hmm. not rappers, you know, but like producers and stuff. And yeah, there were there were some like weird touch points before then. Like uh, I guess Dalek would be one. Yeah, so we actually had Dalek play at Chunk once. Which, bearing in mind for anyone who's never been to Chunk, Chunk is like a seventy capacity room <laughs> on like an industrial estate. Um, yeah, we had Dalek play there, and it was amazing. Like one of the two biggest gigs we've had at Chunk, maybe the biggest actually. How how did you uh, guys land that one? Uh, I don't know. So it was um, Steve who used to play drums in Cattle. If you know that band, mm. uh, he put on that show, and I think, yeah, I don't know how he landed it. To be honest. Um, it was cool. It was like a lot of work because they had, understandably, they had like way higher like expectations yeah. than a lot of bands that play there in terms of like what they were expecting <laughs> from like the PA, what they were expecting in terms of like, you know, uh, the rider and w- whatever. But it was, it was cool. It was a good night. What, you know, I, I, I don't suppose you could talk about what was on that rider, could you? I, can, I I would love to, but I can't remember, sadly. I can tell you some other good ones. So I used to do, when I was like 19, I used to occasionally, like, as a way of kind of getting into gigs for free, mm-hmm. I used to, like, do, in inverted commas, like, artist liaison for, like, <laughs> local, for, like sort of medium-sized local gigs. And it would be, like, you know, I had, like, a friend who worked at, like, a sort of mid-sized local venue. Mm -hmm. And he was, like... I don't even know what his job was. He did, like, some kind of admin thing for gigs. I don't really know what his job officially was, but he would... If there was a gig I wanted to go to, and sometimes even if there was a gig I didn't want to go to, Mm -hmm. I'd get roped in. But it it would be, like, (laughs) yeah, you can come for free, but you just have to, like, come down and, like, be the band's, like, errand boy. (laughs) for the evening so like there was um slum village which is oh wow uh, yeah well uh, is, it, is it jay diller that was in slum village i think so um yeah obviously by the time this happened he was not but uh yeah mm-hmm. i did artist liaison for slum village and like one of one of those guys was like insistent that he would not play the show unless he could have a turkey burger so like the uh the venue this venue <laughs> sold burgers but they did not sell turkey burgers so we had to like go to the supermarket and buy like turkey mints <laughs> and bring it to the kitchen specifically so they could make one one turkey burger for this one guy in Slum Village because he was like, I won't play with, without a turkey burger. <laughs> so, and that thing is, I imagine as well, he was probably just wanting like a shitty, like, like frozen turkey but like ready-made turkey burger. But he, what he probably, what he, what he ended up getting was like some gourmet shit because like, they had like quite a fancy burger kitchen at this venue <laughs> and we just we brought them turkey mints to use so yeah that was probably like way it might that might might not have even really been what he wanted like i think what he wanted was like yeah like shitty like ready made like um <laughs> like captain bird's eye or whatever i i think he might have just made that request because i i know some artists just ask for stuff because they can 
So they'll just put stuff on the rider like, oh, that they're never gonna do this. And like, oh yeah. Like, I don't know how many restaurants carry turkey as like to make burgers with. So not a huge amount, I don't think. No. Um. Yeah. Like, I mean, sometimes that's like a power thing, or sometimes it's just, you know, like musicians are often just quite weird people. Yeah. Um, and don't necessarily have like an understanding of like social norms so like may I, maybe I shouldn't actually say who this was but like a friend of mine put on a show and it was like a, a an artist from overseas Oh, and he was like quite a weird guy this artist who shall remain nameless that's, and apparently like it's when okay he was, we know it's tiny uh, Tim <laughs> after after sound check, apparently he was just like um, he was like, "I want you to bring me the best burger in town." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, didn't you know? Didn't have it wasn't like he had an idea of like I've heard about this place that's good. I want to go and eat there. He's just like, "Bring me the best burger in town." <laughs> um, so yeah, whatever. Like, I mean, why not if you can if if you can convince someone to bring you the best burger in town, why would you? Why wouldn't you want to do that? Like, I, I'd love the best burger in town, please. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I can kind of understand that as well because if you're touring and you're coming in from overseas, and you certainly don't want the worst burger in town. No, you definitely yeah. don't. Um, especially something that's like really greasy, really fatty. Something that's going to, mm. like, kill you. Because uh, you're probably eating just garbage most of the time. Anyway. Oh, yeah. So I, I can I can relate to that. You know, the, the need to have a better meal. I can understand that desire. I get it. I've, I've been in that position before. But usually when I'm in that position where I've been, like, eating like shit for a week, my solution to that isn't, like, bring me the best burger in town. My solution is to just, like have a fucking salad <laughs> that's, that's how to make you know if you're feeling like awful on tour then that's the solution i i think it i think it's a little different in the states although that they do have different restaurants down there but it's like i think in some places in the states getting salad on tour is like impossible i think yeah no, that's fair i, I mean anywhere to be it can be difficult yeah um the best place like in general in my experience not that we've played like all over the world we've played in the uk obviously mm. and we've played in like france belgium and germany and that's like it but in my experience out of all those like the sort of the southeast of france they always <laughs> feed you really really well if you play like a punk show like anywhere kind of near the like Swiss border or Italian border in France, like they, f yeah, you get fed amazingly, like unbelievable. <laughs> like what would, I, I hate to, I hate to go back to the food, but like, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about regional cheese? I would be content if this entire conversation was just about food. So don't, don't feel like you have to apologize. <laughs> about that um so it was like well so it's difficult so at the so we've our lineup has changed slightly since then but at the mm -hmm. time out of the five of us in thank we had like uh like two vegans two vegetarians and one meat eater mm -hmm. so largely we you know we tell the promoters that and largely it would be like the one you know on the rest of that tour it would be like the the one meat eater would get fed well and then the veggie guys it was like 50 50 and then me and cameron who who are both vegan like it was you it might be like you would have like noodles like plain noodles and a little pot of olive oil or something like oh. that, that kind of vibe that was like <laughs> most of that tour but then and you, and you know it's like fact like i'm i get it like i understand like veganism is kind of awkward so i don't I, i'm not the sort of person who if that happens i'm not gonna like kick <laughs> off i'm just gonna be like cool this is food that's fine but but like um yeah when we anywhere we played kind of in that sort in that 
kind of region of France, like the kind of southeast. The like vegan food was just like amazing. So I'm trying to remember what we had. I think like we played at this like I don't think it was a squat, but like a lot of the time people are kind of cagey about whether or not someone actually is or isn't a squat. So who's to say? But we played, we played <laughs> basically like in a barn uh, in the middle of the countryside uh, in in Gigot, I think is how you say it, uh, in in this region of France called Drôme, and like. Again, both of those, I probably totally butchered the pronunciation. But we played this show, and, like, I think we got given like, this, like, amazing Thai curry, um, like, like vegan Thai curry. And it was, like, I don't know who all the people were necessarily. It was, like, we sound-checked, and then, like, an hour before the gig, there was just, like, I guess it was just, like, a... I'm trying to remember. I feel like... In my head, there was, like, a bell that rang, almost like it was school dinner time. And just like there was just like a massive queue of people queuing up, and there was like a bit a huge vat of um, like Thai curry, and it was amazing. And then as well, we played in uh, Grenoble, which is like a, another city that's like in the Alps, kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, we played there and at this like kind of anarchist social centre sort of thing, um, and got. I can't remember what everything was, but the main thing was like this amazing, like homemade seitan. Um, yeah, it was good. Good shit. Love it. Can't get enough. <laughs> We're going to have to schedule you some tours where it's just, you know, where the food's good. And that's it. That's all I care about. <laughs> it's, not, it's not all I care about, but it's, it's good. And, you know, there are, there are two wolves inside of me, one of whom loves noise rock and the other one loves delicious vegan treats <laughs> just a head it's up for anybody who's listening if you're coming that's to it see. yeah but promoters take note <laughs> <laughs> um you know uh what, what you're gonna have to do is start bringing your own chef on tour from now on oh man so like Again, I feel like this band should remain nameless. Um, but like a relatively big band that I have insider knowledge of for every, for every for every gig like have backstage like um uh one of the things on their rider there's like a bunch of things, but one of the things, and I thought this was amazing. Like, I don't want to, I don't want it to come across like I'm saying this in a disparaging way, because mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, sick. One of the things on their ride was they they asked for a selection of local heirloom tomatoes, <laughs> and I was like, yes, good, love that, please more of that. <laughs> no, that's nice. Um, you know, uh, I, I I don't, I I know. Where around where I live, there's not so many independent growers, farmers. <laughs> so what you're saying is that the local heirloom tomatoes where you are would be shit. Oh, is that what you're telling me? They'd be hot shit. Um, but th- there's there's a That's few. That's a shame. I know, I know. We could we could go to the grocery store and grab you some. But yeah, uh, I, I think there's a significantly. Not significantly, but kind of skewed few food culture over here in North America with regards to what we eat and how we consume consume it. Cause do, you, do you know do you know what? So this is this is gonna alienate some people listening, for which I apologize, but so so I'm vegan mm-hmm. and like probably two thirds of my close friends are. And obviously that can be difficult if you're going out for a meal anywhere, like any kind of restaurant or whatever, and especially if you're in, like, a new city. But the most difficult, the most awkward (laughs) dining experience (laughs) I've ever had is going out for dinner in Leeds with two Americans. Oh, God. Like, like that was far (laughs) more, like, so much more difficult. Like, two Americans who ate meat, by the way. Like, so it's not... Two Americans who had a... 
supposedly just like regular <laughs> diet, but the, the most there seems to be like an obsession with like like a, a an American thing of like being obsessed with like very so obviously if someone is allergic to something yeah of course like you can't help being allergic to something but being like very obsessed with like very minor stuff and like being like obsessed with like cross contamination of things <laughs> to the like I, I don't feel I don't feel like I'm explaining this very well but like yeah I don't know it's the, like the to the to to the point where like someone who is like yeah I have like a mild I have a mild peanut allergy like refusing to eat anywhere that has ever had a peanut in the kitchen <laughs> kind, of, kind of vibe and that's I've never experienced that from like English people that seems to be like an American thing of this weird like I don't know it's hard to explain like, like I say I'm gonna just any American listening now is gonna be like fuck you Freddie <laughs> fuck you for trying to make me eat eat something that has been within 100 yards of a peanut like like because it's now it now it just sounds like i'm criticizing people for having allergies which i'm not but it's just like yeah i don't know though it was like a i can't describe it but like yeah and thankfully these are not people who i'm likely to ever cross paths with again not because i didn't like them but just because if they hear this then they'll be mad at me (laughs) <laughs> um, but like, just they were, you know, perfectly nice people. But it was like going out in Leeds with two Americans was just like, man, I've never heard someone ask a waitress so many questions in my life. Like, what is this? What's it's like, happening? It's like that Portlandia sketch where they're just like, where? Oh, yeah, where's the chicken? Where was come the from? chicken born? Sort of thing. <laughs> and they want to know its name. It was absolutely that kind of vibe. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, now, I, I'm going to kind of jump to their defense a little bit because I, I, I like part part of the reason why they're probably so like anal and worried about that sort of stuff is because over here uh, with regards to allergies, you know, mm-hmm. there are certain things that are just like just banned from schools. Like you cannot. I think I, I think, you know, I mean, it's been years since I've been to like uh elementary school but from what i recall peanuts are just like banned at most of them there's certain foods that you just can't even bring into the school because some kids have had such bad reactions from them so it's like it's been drilled into our heads that having certain foods uh you know Maybe it is, like, a cultural thing, because, yeah, I feel like here... Like, I have friends who have, like, severe allergies to things. Yeah. But it's, like, you'll go out with them, and they'll just be like, okay, I will make sure the thing that I ordered does not have this in, (laughs) and then that's fine. Like, that's kind of, like... Or, you know, just, like, if someone is ordering the thing that I'm allergic to, I'll make sure that I'm not sat next to them. Yeah. You know, that like, that kind of vibe. Um... And maybe maybe we don't care enough. Maybe I'm gonna kill all my friends f- through giving them, f- through you know putting them into anaphylactic shock. I, who knows? Um, I, I I'm gonna roll those dice, baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I agree 100 percent that there is a marked cultural difference uh, with regards to the food culture and just like kind of the attitude surrounding it. Because, uh, yeah, I don't, sure. I don't hear about schools from the UK banning, like, peanut butter sandwiches. So, so this is, like, related. So, for my day job, I have to, like, travel quite a bit. So, sometimes for my day job, I am in the US. Mm-hmm. And a little while ago, uh, I can't remember where I was, somewhere, somewhere in the US. And I was in a taxi. This is, like, a year or two ago. Like, pre-COVID. Um, I was in a taxi and the taxi driver was telling me about her boyfriend who was like currently at the time was like currently traveling in Europe. And the first thing, this is like unrelated, but just funny was that she didn't, she couldn't comprehend that like Europe wasn't one country. Um, (laughs) and so it was asking me about Europe and I was like, 
gently because you know it's like that's not her fault if she doesn't know that i was like yeah. trying to like gently explain and the one so she kept for one thing she kept talking about paris france and saying it like that was the name of the city not like paris in france it was like paris france um and like she, like and the the vibe i got from the conversation was that she thought paris france was the name of a city in the country called europe and like <laughs> That, that, and that's not her fault. Like, but it was. But what I was, what I was gonna say is, and then she was telling me about how her boyfriend. So he was like traveling around Europe, and like, it sounded like he'd been to loads of different places. Like, apparently, excuse me, sorry. Apparently, he'd been to like uh, the UK, and he'd been to like Amsterdam, like the you know the Netherlands, mm-hmm. um, and he'd been to like some Scandinavian countries and. And she was telling me that her boyfriend, his whole trip traveling around Europe, had only eaten at McDonald's because he didn't trust food hygiene standards in Europe, oh which already is ridiculous because in most of Europe, not in every country, because obviously mm-hmm. it varies country to country, but in most Western European countries, food hygiene standards are, to my knowledge, significantly better than the US anyway. <laughs> but like, yeah. but she, he, he didn't trust... Any Euro- apparently he, he just didn't trust that any restaurant in Europe would be clean. And he assumed that because McDonald's was American, that any McDonald's restaurant in Europe would adhere to American <laughs> food standards. <laughs> like just, I was like sat in the back of this taxi like, mm-hmm, yep, oh, yeah, oh, sure, why not? Sounds, sounds fine, I guess. Um, yeah, like... I mean, that's funny. Like, of all the restaurants, McDonald's, I mean, I've I been to a McDonald's. Time. I was, like, trying to... Because I was like, you know what? That's, you know, I don't know. For me, and I think for a lot of other people, like, food is, like, a big part of travelling. So I was, like, saying to this taxi driver, kind of trying to... Again, like, gently, but trying to be like, oh, you know, actually, like, food standards in Europe are pretty good, like, certainly in most Mm -hmm. of Western Europe. And, you know, like, maybe... I was hoping she'd, like, pass on the message, I guess. Like, (laughs) he'd probably be okay. Like, he should, you know, try some, like, local cuisine and stuff. I'm sure that that message was not passed on. No. Um,
yeah, it's 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 funny that that uh, that uh, that person was so concerned about food standards because you just look at so many restaurants in the United States and they're they just get like D's F's from the uh, from the health board because there there are um, there are health inspectors in the United States. Crazy, I know. <laughs> but, I can believe it. I can believe it. But uh, you'll see like these restaurants that have like uh, D's and F's and people will just eat at them. Like I, I think most people are unaware of how disgusting the restaurant industry in general is. You've got to eat a bit of dirt before you die. That's what my mum always said. <laughs> It's a very morbid thing for my mom to say. That's, yeah, that's what she'd say. Uh, I mean, it's true. Um, and there, I don't think there's any way to necessarily get around not having, you know, a bad meal at one time in your life, you know, and worrying about that so much is just, it, it seems a little ridiculous to me. But we've hey. all been there. We've all we've all had dodgy falafel from the falafel truck, <laughs> and 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 faced the consequences for three days after. You know, we've all we've all been there. Oh God, yeah. I think first place I ever had food poisoning was from a Taco Bell. Um, <laughs> last place I ever had food poisoning from was this uh, pizza place right down the street from me. So, you know, it happens. You you can't get too hung up on it. You got to move on with your life. You have your diarrhea, and <laughs> that's it. So last time I had food poisoning, we should probably talk about something other than food at some point. But yeah, probably. Last time I had food poisoning, I was again I was away on business, and um, every night, like when I'd got back to the hotel and I'd turn the TV on for this like whole trip, mm-hmm. I'd put the TV on and. There was, like, almost nothing on that was, like, tolerable apart from, I think it was on Comedy Central. There was, like, every night that week, there was a South Park marathon. And I'm not, like, a big fan of South Park, but it's, like, it's there. It's background noise. It's, like, whatever. And um, on that trip, near the end of the trip, I got quite bad food poisoning from a falafel truck. And that's why it was on my mind, the dodgy falafel. Um, and <laughs> that, so th- that was on like the Friday. And then I kind of felt a bit weird for the rest of the day because that was on my lunch. But I was okay. And then I woke up Saturday and was just like fucked. Like just my my insides <laughs> were very unhappy. And so on the Saturday evening, my like colleagues were going out for you know go, going on a night out mm-hmm. and um and and I was like yeah there's no way there's no way I can I cannot possibly do this I can't stay away from the bathroom for more than 25 minutes so that it, like there's no way but it's fine you know I'll be I'll be I'll be in the hotel and there'll probably be another south park marathon on and that's adequate I can deal <laughs> with that and I got in and it wasn't for that for that one evening they changed it to an an Adam Sandler marathon, <laughs> <laughs> and I flicked through the channel, and there was there was that was still the best option of like out of everything that was on, and it was like not even because you know he's done some okay films like Uncut mm-hmm. Gems is obviously very good, and like even some of his like comedy films are like pretty good but it was like it was the it was like the worst adam sandler films it was like grown-ups too so like (laughs) that level of shit and i was just there like with nothing else to do because i was in a hotel Mm -hmm. um like just shitting my pants and watching adam sandler be not funny (laughs) it was awful hated it and the, and four of the songs on the thank record are about that, <laughs> are about <laughs> shitting myself and watching Adam Sandler. That sounds like hell, man. <laughs> That's it, exactly. That's why I've no. There's there's not any songs about it, to be honest, which is surprising. Maybe we, maybe that's for album two. You know, I mean, 
if Static X can write a song about shitting in a bag, why can't Thank? Let me tell you. Good question. Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess mo- moving on from food and, you know, food poisoning and bathroom yep. problems. <laughs> um, uh, so, jeez. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, wh- when can we expect the new album to be dropping? So it's not confirmed yet. So at the moment, apparently there's like a six month turnaround for vinyl pressing, mm-hmm. it's which cr- makes things difficult. It is. So, and that's if you um, don't get bumped back. Yeah. So we're kind of we're hoping to get it mixed and mastered like soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really, like we I think we're aiming to have the album come out in February. And we'll maybe have like uh, one or two singles like late this year, maybe like around October, November time. Um, but we do have we have other stuff before then. So it's not like new stuff, but we're we're releasing uh, on the first of July. Mm-hmm. We're releasing a compilation called Thankology. Which is uh, all of our. It's basically like a kind of early years of Thank compilation, mm-hmm. I guess. So it's like all the tracks off of our first tape, all the tracks off of the Please 10 inch that we released, and our side of the Blom split all on one thing. So that's going to be on tape and CD. Have Excuse you me, thought I'll about. Say that again because my voice went weird. Tape and CD. Um, <laughs> Uh, can we expect any other unusual formats for that one? Like, say, maybe uh, 8-track, I hear those are coming back. Um, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, 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 if any labels want to get in touch who release 8-track recordings, then by all means, or like Wax Cylinder or whatever, um, be my guest. I've seen a few bands recently releasing, like, 5-inch vinyl, which is interesting. <laughs> I um, I think that's that's just about uh, saving some money right there. Well, is it though? I mean, I I don't know how much five inch vinyl costs, but like a seven inch costs almost as much to make as a twelve inch. So, I I actually don't know. Let's 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 take so a look at some of the prices. Doing a five inch doesn't seem like it would be that cheap, but maybe it is. I, and also, like already, already, I almost never buy seven inches because I'm too lazy to get up to turn <laughs> over the record that often. So a five inch, that's you're making me do too much work, and I'm not. Are they I'm not okay with it? Are they lathe cut or are they actually pressed though? I I don't know. Because I was gonna say I just found this. I, and I don't want this to turn into uh, a uh, promotional consideration for the show because they're not paying me. Um, but there's this Phonocut record maker which cuts records, five-inch records. Interesting. Apparently, they don't sound particularly good, but that's not the point. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, sounding good is overrated, isn't it? Who needs it? It's true. In, Who in, needs to sound good? I think in some ways, some people are a little bit more interested in having an object to put on a shelf than they oh, are yeah. in the music itself. I mean, I agree with that. That's why I like cassettes more than I like CDs. I don't generally listen to cassettes. I do occasionally. Mm-hmm. But like, I think a cassette is a nicer object than a CD. And That's I true. don't really listen to either. Like I, I listen to vinyl and I listen to like Spotify. <laughs> and those are my two that's my like two listening habits. I haven't downloaded music in like four years or something. So um yeah, that that for me is like a big thing and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's sometimes implicitly when you not when you personally, but when someone says that like oh you know people just want to have the object there's like some something this like something disparaging about that but it's 
I don't know. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with buying a nice object that, that you like? You know, that's true. Uh, I, to, and to be fair, I am also kind of putting myself into that camp because I buy vinyl, but I don't really listen to vinyl. I buy it to mainly just be like, oh, this is the to format. It. Well, it's it's more about like supporting the artists at this point. Because I, I yeah. feel like I feel like buying a record is kind of like, you know, it's 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 charity <laughs> for the band. It's like, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I suppose it's like, I don't know. I do listen to vinyl. I I really like like mm-hmm. the ritual of it. Um, but certainly not all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, like it's not convenient. No, exactly. I can't play vinyl in my car, for example, but um, <laughs> I like it. Uh, I've I've been buying more vinyl than usual over like the past year, just because mm-hmm. what else is there to spend my money on? <laughs> um, Digital downloads. Well, true. I, I, I suppose part of the problem with that is I haven't owned a laptop in about four years either. Oh, so wow. I, I mean, I'm communicating with you from a laptop right now, but it belongs to my place of work. <laughs> so there's a limit to how many things I can download onto it. I think oh, like, yeah. I, can do, I can do some stuff, and that's fine. But I think having like a fucking like 30 gigabyte music library or whatever oh, yeah. be... That that would be unacceptable. I d- I don't think that they would be happy with that. Yeah, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm just like uh, shitting on people who prefer one format or another because I feel like in some ways there's uh, too much of that with uh, when it comes to digital audio, particularly. Um, you know, it's what I I think the best way to listen to music is whichever way works for you personally totally you know economics there's like, there's, aside there's so many releases over the past like five years or so oh yeah that only exist on Bandcamp as well so like there's some really amazing like local bands in leeds who didn't do who never did a physical release or if mm-hmm. they did it was like they did one tape that had like 20 copies <laughs> you know um they either ne- you know they never did a physical release and they didn't necessarily like have their shit together enough to get it on like Spotify and Apple mm-hmm. Music and stuff because even though that's it's quite easy to do that it's still like a bit of a pain in the ass like like Thank wasn't on Spotify for ages just because I couldn't be bothered and then like people kept asking me after gigs like people would come up to me after a show and be like oh are you on Spotify and I'd say no buy a tape and they'd go. No, I don't want to buy a tape. <laughs> so after a while, I was like, oh, fine, I guess. <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there's quite a lot of bands that I love from the past yeah. like five years where it's literally like they have two EPs or whatever that are on Bandcamp as like, and it's like, it's one pound on Bandcamp and that's <laughs> it. And that's the only place you can get it. Um so, you know, who am I to say that that's, like, incorrect or that, like, someone enjoying that music is bad? Oh, yeah. A lot of it's really good. I'm going to, again, I'm, I feel like a lot of this whole discussion has just been me telling you things to listen to, like <laughs> Territorial Gobbing and Algonon Cornelius and whatever. But um, just listen to this, Aaron. These are the these. are This is the good music <laughs> that you that you should like but um there's like uh within leeds there's kind of within the sort of leeds punk scene i guess there's like a kind of smaller scene of people Mm -hmm. who continually just seem to be like starting Mm -hmm. new bands together and new configurations of the kind of same like 10 people oh this you know what if you're gonna start beef with blacklisters i don't want any part of it no not at all i mean no black blacklisters uh, are not one of these bands and also i love i love blacklisters and i'm not starting beef with any of these bands no it's great it's like it's a very fertile part of the scene but like two of my favorite bands to come out of that 
uh, there's like a very like spooky like hardcore band called Human Certainty who I absolutely loved um, like some of the best to ever do it and then also out of that same kind of mini micro scene um, was a band called Perfect Blue uh, who were like a kind of I guess like like Jerome's Dream style like screamo violence sort of stuff and it was so good and again both of those bands I think didn't do anything physical and aren't on any like proper in inverted commas streaming services yeah uh, actually no Perfect Blue I think had a tape maybe but uh yeah, just like the the one thing, my one problem with any of that. So this isn't a criticism of any of the bands, but my one problem is like, if Bandcamp ever ceases to exist, and I know that feels like right now, that's like that'll never happen. Bandcamp oh, is forever. No, no. But it's like you know, like we've just seen Yahoo Answers. That's gone. <laughs> who's to, who's to say Bandcamp won't be next? That's the, um, th- that is my one thing. I'm like. You know, it's like okay, if 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 Bandcamp ceases to exist, all that music is like kind of gone forever, which is mm-hmm. kind of freaky. Um, but also, very good bands would recommend them. Yeah, um, I, I'll be posting links to them in the description. But uh, it's interesting that you brought up uh, music preservation because I've I've actually been trying to like get this whole big essay about uh, art preservation out of my head for about like a few years now. And I'm like, uh, right. I feel like there's so much to say about it. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's actually funny that you mentioned Yahoo answers going away because I was, I've been thinking like, what happens if YouTube goes away? What happens if all of a sudden, you know, the, the internet just disappears, like hypothetically speaking, that's unlikely, but could happen. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because it looked like maybe like two or three years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. It looked like SoundCloud was going to go, mm-hmm. and then it didn't. But it looked like that was going to go, and there wasn't much notice given on that. I can't remember the exact details, but it was something like maybe there was a thing that was like SoundCloud might mm-hmm. go down next week or something. It was like it... Like it was, it it wasn't people didn't get much notice so it's yeah. like if you're a producer whose entire because obviously yeah there's not much in the way of like punk music or any kind of like guitar music on soundcloud yeah but there's a lot of like electronic music a lot of my favorite electronic music is only on soundcloud um so you know if you're a producer whose entire catalog is only on soundcloud and you've never done any You've never done any physical release. Maybe you're not the most disciplined at like backing stuff up, mm-hmm. and you get like a week's notice, like all of your stuff is gonna go. It's crazy, and th- thankfully it didn't. Like SoundCloud is still around. Yeah, but like, I don't know, scary. Yeah, I mean, we lose a lot of our culture year after year, uh, and we don't really think about preservation so much. And I, I read a tweet a little while ago. I say I read a tweet as if it took me ages. I saw a tweet. It took me three <laughs> seconds to read it. Um, I saw a tweet that was like said, said something like, um, "This period of history might be one of the you know for, for historians like a hundred years from now or two hundred mm-hmm. years from now, or whatever. This period of history that we're in now might be one of the most difficult periods of history to document." in retrospect, because so much, like, media is just, like, transient, and there's no... Oh, there's not no, there's not none, but so much stuff doesn't have any kind of, like, physical, like, paper trail. Yeah. And so many of these big companies like Yahoo or whatever don't seem to bat an eyelid over deleting stuff. No. So, yeah, like, a historian in the year like, I don't know, 2200 or whatever. It's just, what are they going to have to go on? Yeah, uh, the best that we can hope for is something like the Internet Archive, but even that is incomplete, you know? Yeah. Um, and we're already seeing a lot of it. We're seeing some things happen right now, and 
part of the reason why I got on this whole like tangent was Flash went away. And for for younger people who may be listening, Flash was this infrastructure of the internet that a lot of early uh, websites were built on. And a lot of animations were used to create a lot of like early net art was used to create. And now all of that, because the standard is now like, I think HTML5, all of that art is in some way lost. It can never be experienced the same way that it could be like 10, 20 years ago. Wasn't the wasn't the first version of YouTube Flash based? I mm-hmm. imagine that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so yeah, just all and like pre YouTube, like if you wanted to watch a funny cartoon on the internet, then yeah, it was all Flash. Yeah. Um, I think you're I think you're a few years older than me, Aaron. But like, yeah, people my age. So I'm I'm 27. Like people kind of around my age, like. You know, maybe maybe up to like two or three years younger than me. Oh yeah, and like maybe a few years older than me, are like the last kind of age group that experienced like the decentralized internet when we were growing up, where it wasn't like it is now, where it's like there are three websites basically. Yeah, when it's like there's like <laughs> Twitter and YouTube and uh not even facebook really now so it's like like twitter youtube and instagram basically yeah. like there are the three websites that we all use um yeah like it's it's mad um it, that even for me like people even people like three years younger than me maybe have not experienced that yeah um kind of wild it is it's just like you know um and and because that standard has changed, you know, s- some of that has just inevitably been lost because the only reason why YouTube is still existing the way it does is because they took action to adopt the new standard. Well, what if you didn't feel like adopting the new standard? What if, say you were a creator and you happened to pass away? and you're a small creator and your art was not really archived well you know you lose your domain you know if they if they stop charging your credit card and you know you know maybe you just your art was just built on that well now it's no Mm. longer accessible and i i i don't want to sound very you know like like all of this stuff was so important but it's just it's just so strange to me that that is important though. Yeah. It is important. I mean, that period in time has just been like, essentially it's, it's no longer existing anymore. It, it might as well be ancient Egypt at this point for how accessible it is. Yeah, no, you, you're totally right. It's, uh, it's kind of, kind of crazy. Um, well, not even kind of. It is objectively crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Like, sometimes I am just of the mindset where I'm like, blow up the entire internet. <laughs> <laughs> Get it gone. The internet was a mistake. But also, so much culture from like the past 25 mm-hmm. years only exists on the internet and exists in this like temporal form that we and so much of it even if you know even if we came up with like a an appropriate solution for how to like save and archive all this stuff there's too much of it now for us to do that like, oh, yeah. effectively you know and you know then you have play things that are behind paywalls that are just frankly completely inaccessible because um i'm not saying that uh, g- capitalism is bad or anything like that or people shouldn't be paid for their art but the fact is that certain things are only accessible once you get past that paywall and then and then what like some albums are only on spotify right like yeah what? i think you have to like make a decision as an artist about stuff like that so yeah. for example Beige Palace 
is quite resolutely the 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 mindset behind Beige Palace is quite resolutely that Beige Palace is not in any way like a vehicle to make any kind of money. Mm-hmm. Um, not that that's not that that's me saying thank is the money spinner where I'm going <laughs> to get the big bucks, but like they're, 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 there's two very different approaches to to both of those bands in terms of like thank is at least like open to that on some level. Uh, whereas Beige Palace is be- basically right. Beige Palace is Fugazi. We're Fugazi. Um, we we love ethics. Can't get enough of it. But <laughs> but but what I mean by that is like um, Beige Palace is very resolutely like all of our music. You can download it for free if you want to, mm-hmm. and we don't like have any merch and. Uh, it's all like the only stuff you can buy from us is our records and that's it and like we tour kind of as it, it, to as much of an extent as we can like the tours we do are like Spartan sort of stuff where it's like we we tour within our means to as much of an extent as we can whereas like, whereas like Thank is like we've got fucking loads of stupid equipment that we have to cut about everywhere <laughs> and like um the the records themselves, particularly the one we've just done, that it's a bit. In order to make that music in the first place, you need like more of a budget to make it, sort mm-hmm. of stuff. So it's like you know, there's different things, but you've got a. The point I'm making is, and I'm possibly being slightly incoherent because I've just realised that this beer I'm drinking is ten percent. Um, but, but the point <laughs> the point I'm making is that uh, like. What point am I making? No, the point I'm making is that you have to make a decision as, like, an artist. Mm-hmm. Like, how am I going to kind of posit this? Like, am I going to make this as accessible as I possibly can and make it as widely available as I can? And therefore, it's something that maybe might have some longevity. Mm-hmm. Or am I going to do this in a way that's like, yeah, maybe it's behind some paywalls and we're there's there's more of an intent to make some money behind it. Yeah. And maybe that means that it might be more difficult for people to find in some ways, but also it may maybe means that there can be more of a more of a payoff. I don't know. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say that uh, just putting things behind a paywall makes it completely inaccessible, because you know, I I think about all of the stuff from the blog spot blogs back when music yeah. sharing via blogspot was a real thing people would be yeah. sharing all kinds of weird shit that way and now it's kind of transitioned over to youtube it's like oh you can just look it up on youtube now so uh i like the convenience of that though yeah that you can just go on youtube and find anything but yeah i guess i guess the point i'm making aaron is that no one should ever listen to thank um and anyone who does is wrong and bad um <laughs> uh, if you've ever listened to thank then you deserve to be banned from the internet um <laughs> and if you've even thought about listening to thank then you should stop thinking about it um <laughs> and if you've ever even said the word thank then you should pay me one thousand pounds. I guess that's what I'm saying. That's the point that I'm making. This is because I won't shut up about your last record, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. That's right. Exactly. Um, uh, so, so do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to lead us off with? Gosh, um, not really. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess all you know. All I'll say is just. Um, well, this has been a nice time. I'd like to say that. And also just, yeah, if I'm doing like business for a minute, look out for the Fancology compilation. It's coming out on 1st of July and uh, we're releasing a video for Commemorative Coin uh, next week, the 3rd of June. Although by the time people hear this, it might not be next week. I don't know how soon (laughs) it's going to be online. But certainly... If the 3rd of June is in the future, then keep an eye out. And if 
and if it has already been the 3rd of June by the time you, you're hearing this, then go and look it up because it'll be on the internet. Um, yeah, thanks. Nice one. <laughs> All right, Freddie. Well, I would like to thank... <laughs> thank you very much for uh, coming on the show you today. said it. Yeah, that's $1,000. I know you can afford it. You're the the. You've got your podcast empire. <laughs> I, I'm now a media empire, folks. That's no. it. Um, exactly. Uh, but if if I have any sway, I will incentivize people to go check out whatever you guys have coming up because uh, I, I you know I think I think what you're doing is pretty cool. I, I don't want to say very exciting because I think that would be a little too. Uh, it don't sound like nepotism here, but uh, it's electrifying. It's got me on the edge of my seat. Um, Thanks. <laughs> and I'm definitely looking forward to whatever you put out next. So, Freddie, thank you very much for coming on. The rest of you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for having me. All right. You have yourself an excellent beer. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a blueberry muffin flavored stout, which you'd think might be awful, but it's actually delicious. So there you go. There we go. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> okay.
feet on. Do anything for anyone. Morally, You've got your awful smile. Do anything it's not.